Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ARM with Ron Moore and Lori Koskinen, who are going to talk today about near-threshold computing. Ron, what sort of applications need near-threshold computing? Why are we starting to see this now? We've heard about it in the past, but it's starting to crop up again. Near threshold is coming up because we need to have devices that are deployed for many years and they're in a disposable sense. You can't replace the battery, you can't charge the battery, so we need something that will, will run with minimum energy for a long period of time. So this has been talked about in the past, but why hasn't it been implemented? Well, it is a design technique that's been used in the past, but it takes a lot of effort and you have to be able to handle the variation and handle the dynamic range of, of design in this case. So Ron mentioned uh, a minimum point, and there actually is a minimum point. So I drew up a graph here on the x-axis. Uh, you have your VDD, your operating voltage, uh, where your processors and your DSPs work at. And then on the y-axis, energy. So if you start drawing an energy curve, it'll look something like this, a bunch of J, where there is a minimum point uh, which is somewhere around the point three, maybe a little bit above that. And point 1.2, 1.1 over here, uh, that's your nominal operating voltage. That's where your, your processors nowadays, you know, you take your mobile phone or, or you take your smartwatch and you have 40 nanometer or 55 nanometer, 28 nanometer technology. They'll operate at around this uh, area, 1.1, 1 1.2 volts. And the minimum point here at, at 0 0.5, 0 0.3 or something above that. And if you look at then the energy, what you get going down from here to here is about 15x. So if you take your processor, uh, you take your DSP and drop its operating voltage uh, from 1.2 down here to, to about 0.4, uh, it'll be 15x. You can go through the semiconductor math, you can make a chip and measure it, and 15x is around the range that you'll get to. We're talking here about energy. What's the metric that we need? Is it energy or power? The two tend to get blurred together, but they're really not the same. Well, the reason why they do get blurred is because during the design, we're talking about saving power in, in signing off for power. So whether it be leakage or dynamic power. But in operation, we're talking about energy. We need this point here to be the amount that the battery can supply over time. Not any this, you know, we're not the power that we're dissipating at a particular instance, but what we're supplying for energy over the lifetime of the device. So power is how effectively you use that energy, but the energy is the total that's in your battery. That is correct. The energy is the total available that you have for current in your device. The power will be consumed over time. So sub-threshold computing has been a problem because of the fall-off in performance. As we get to near threshold, how close can we get to the point where it's good enough, but at the same time we're saving that massive amount of energy? That's exactly correct, Ed. Uh, the problem has been with, with previous semiconductor technology, something like 90 nanometer and above, you really don't get the performance you need. So, so if, if I uh, superimpose another graph here, uh, Let's put another y-axis, uh, uh, which would be now performance. And I'll just give this, keep this as a uh, proportional performance. So I'll put 100 here, and I'll put 1 here, which is, again, uh, the proportionality that you'll see when you go to sub and near threshold. So, so I'll draw another graph here. So roughly an inverse of, of uh, the energy curve. And, and when you go into sub and near threshold, you will see about a 100x uh, re reduction in performance. But with these 55 nanometer, 40 nanometer, 28 nanometer technologies, which are the ones that you'd see you know, in your ultra low power uh, smartwatch chips and things like that, you can split this up into a, a few 
few categories. And if we take the lowest voltage here, the performance that you get for your processor or your DSP is actually enough for a couple of applications, something like Bluetooth, LE, your Alexa, so your voice wake up. And even uh, you need security in your IoT, so something like cryptography would, would fall into this range. And you do get enough performance in, in this low voltage range uh, for those applications. So Ron, where do you see this getting used? Well, the, there's, a, there's a wide application of, of, of uses there. In fact, the, the first one that comes to my mind is I'd like my uh, headphones to last wirelessly for that 18-hour flight from San Francisco to Singapore. But that's a very traditional kind of design because it can still have the, the kind of the off 95% of the time and then just do a little bit of the work when it's, when it's broadcasting. But as we see the applications getting into the diversity of the Internet of Things and we start talking about a trillion devices going out there, we're going to need different compute models than, than off 99% of the time and then waking up. We're going to need things that are doing low-level computing and computational through the whole time where they're sending data and massaging data long days. When you go to this minimum energy point, it can keep a certain level of continuous processing going at the same battery length as, as if you were to have the wake up and dark silicon peaks. So really what we've done is we've handed off a lot of design to the architects instead of just the, the standard, here's the processor, here's what you can work around this. Absolutely. We've, we've up-leveled the design challenge to the system level, which means now we have to handle the silicon designs a little bit different, and it gets back to the variation that I mentioned earlier, which then also leads into the fact that we're going to have to make sure this is manufacturable. So Lori, how do we get to manufacturability with this? The problem with, with minimum energy and why you really haven't seen it outside of a couple of uh, Swiss watches is yield. So, so what actually happens here is that when you go into this uh, low voltage, you don't know how uh, the transistors and uh, the, the processors and DSPs which are made out of the transistors, you don't know how exactly they'll work. So I drew this one curve, but it might be actually looking like this, or it might be looking like this. And, and this change, is, is actually huge. Uh, you might see something like 10x uh, or, or something like the, to that order. And when you design a processor uh, out of uh, gates which are, are going to change 10x, that will hit your yield and then the business guy will say we will never be able to sell this. Yeah. When it goes on to the tester, does the uh, near threshold computing change the dynamics of how the, it's, the system is tested? Not really, no. Uh, of course, you have to be able to test at low voltage, uh, but in the end, you essentially test every, uh, the same way as you would anything else, uh, but over a different voltage range. One other technique that started to come into this is being able to uh, dynamically alter some of the voltage What's happening there? We've heard about that for a while. It's, it's been a pretty far out there concept. Is this becoming real? And if so, how do we get there? It is actually becoming real. So what happens is, is you need to dynamically understand what's happening in the chip. Until now, it's really been design time. So, so you margin everything in, you know. The chip might be hot, it might be cold, it might be in a bad corner, it might be in a good corner. You margin everything in, you dump it up uh, in, in design time. And, and uh, if your curves don't look like this, that's fine. But when, when your curves really start to go all over the place, then the, the margin that you have to put in design time is gonna be huge and it's gonna eat up most of your 15X that you see here. So that's the problem. So, so what you want to do, ideally, is uh, follow this curve or uh, this array of curves. So, so if, if you're here and you need this amount of performance, 
then you have, to, you have to first know that you're here. That means some kind of monitoring within the chip. And then you have to be able to, to bump up the voltage to a point where you get to that point. So, so you need first the monitoring on chip and then some, some kind of dynamic feedback to do that. But those designs are now coming out there and you will probably see them uh, within a year or two uh, in your uh, home products. So Ron, we've seen a, a lot of techniques come in, coming into designs, uh, everything from uh, dark silicon, which I believe ARM CTO uh, Mike Muller coined the phrase, all the way up to more heterogeneity inside of designs with more different kinds of processors, uh, uh, different sized cores. Where does near threshold fit into the, this world and how do you employ it? Yes, yeah, so it does fit in this world in, again, with the, the types of applications that have to have some continuous computing all the time. And it could be low latency as far as you don't have to have the answer in a certain frame rate, but the systems guys do need continuous updates of the computing. And so this is the, the area where, you know, you want to make sure, as, as, as Laurie's pointed out, you want to make sure it gets the performance needed for the application without the design margin that you have to put in for all the manufacturing cases. Does it give you more flexibility to get into new markets that are still not very well defined at this point? Yes, it does. It gives you more chance to, to take advantage of those markets. You know, there's a lot of compute areas now that uh, we, we would talk about organic computing, if you will. Uh, you know, uh, farming is an, is an area where there's a lot of devices that could be deployed in the crops and things of that nature if they were low enough cost and long enough in, the, in life cycle. Uh, imagine, you know, if you can monitor the, the growth of, of the grapes as, as you're going through your vineyard or the, or the moisture of the soil. This is the kind of applications where you can be doing that. When smartwatches first came out, they were a day or two of battery life. Would something like this have made a big difference in a case like that where you could now modify what you're trying to do with a certain amount of energy? Well, yes. In fact, uh, the first example that you could use is you take your wireless headsets uh, that, that will last, uh, you know, for three or four hours. Now this, this kind of technology could allow them to last 12 or 13 hours between charging. But if you start talking about uh, for a smart watch or even a, a, some other kind of, uh, of applications, you could take a smart watch from two days to a week or to a month. And what we're trying to do is get applications that can be on a coin cell battery for up to 10 years. Those are the new markets that we're wanting to open here. What does this do from the standpoint of cost? Because this is something that will fall into your world more than anybody else's. It, that's an interesting thing. And, and if you think about it, it's going to increase the system design cost. It's going to increase the, uh, the engineering cost because it's going to take a lot more effort to get that margin out of the design. But with that extra effort and some help with our foundry partners to handle the manufacturability and the variation here, we will be able to, uh, to manufacture this for the low cost points that, that, that the market calls for. So, Laurie, how do we knock that effort down? So, I, I believe that you need to do dynamic margining so that you're not doing it at design time, uh, but you're doing it at uh, runtime whenever your system, which you don't really know at design time how, it, how fast and how it's going to work, you have to be able to dynamically make those decisions. And it only not needs a hardware component, so you need to have uh, the monitoring within the hardware, but you also need a software component. So the software understands uh, the hardware and gets uh, the dynamic information straight from the hardware and is able to make this decision so that uh, uh, you get the optimum operating point at every single case. And, and the software also then uh, will mitigate the problems that, that the system design problems that uh, Ron mentioned. So uh, software is much easier to design than hardware. So if you get this into software, then that's your solution in, in getting the products uh, to the market uh, cheap enough. 
Uri Kuskinen and Ron Moore, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.